Boatworks today is sponsored by Total Boat and Alexia Yacht Coatings, as well as supported by the generosity from the beautiful folks over on Patreon. Thank you so much. So welcome back to the shop, everybody. Hope you're all doing very well. My name is Andy with Boatworks today, and this week we're going to talk about spraying gel coat, specifically spraying gel coat using one of these little guys. Now, if you're not familiar with what this is, this is called a Preville sprayer. Essentially, it's a little portable touch-up gun, you know, for the most part. Uh, you've got a, a canister up on top that's under pressure. I don't know what, I couldn't find out what the propellant is, but you got, uh, you know, the, the power head up here. Then you can put whatever you want in a glass jar, and away you go, doing your little touch-ups. Now, you see a lot of people mentioning these uh, online, you know, recommending them for doing, you know, just what I just said, you know, small little touch-ups. And does it work? Sure. Now, does it work well? Now, that's, that's a completely different question. Now, I will say that it, there are some little details, you know, little bits of knowledge that if you have them, uh, it can make a night and day difference on how well these work. And really, that's what we're going to be doing a deep dive on for this week. Now, when you're talking about spraying, you almost always need to add some type of, some type of a reducer or thinner just to get the, the viscosity of the material down to the point where it'll actually shoot through your, your spray nozzle without having to, without it sputtering, splattering, and just, you know, making more of a mess than anything else. And I can tell you right out of the can, gel coat needs a little bit of help if we're going to be using one of these prevails. So now when we're talking about thinners, there are, really there's two different types that are commonly used when you're working with gel coat. You have what are called reactive thinners, and then you have non-reactive thinners. Uh, the main difference so reactive thinners, uh, these are products such as like, uh, you know, Patch Aid or it's the Duratec high gloss additive. These are products that when they're mixed with the gel coat, they actually become part of the gel coat. They, they become one with the gel coat, right? So for example, you know, either of these two products, I believe if you were to catalyze them on their own, they will actually cure to a hard or to, you know, to a cured state on their own. Now, depending on which one you're talking about here, they can be added to gel coat up to like a one-to-one -one ratio, so 50-50. And, you know, that does a couple of things. Uh, obviously, when we're talking about uh, just the ability for being able to, to spray the gel coat, it does great for that because it greatly reduces the viscosity, but it does so at a little bit of a cost. So, for example, uh, I guess the analogy, let's just say you've got a glass of lemonade, right? And, you know, you're drinking it straight, and it tastes fantastic. Well, what's, what's going to happen to the flavor of that lemonade if you cut it 50% with just straight water? All of a sudden now it's probably going to taste like crap, or not, it's not going to taste like much. Now, kind of relating that into gel coat, uh, it, 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 a similar thing happens, except instead of talking about flavor, we're talking about pigment concentration. So now gel coat has a certain level of pigment within a given volume. Uh, so if you were to take that, that volume of gel coat, cut it by half with one of these reducers, now you've just cut that pigment concentration by half. And what ends up happening is that the, the gel coat, it becomes more translucent or more opaque. So in order to get full hide or full coverage, you know, over your substrate with this gel coat, you need to have a thicker, a thicker layer of it, which is fine as long as you're mindful of it. Now, what I see happen more oftentimes than not is that when people are using one of these products to, you know, with their, for their repair area, they'll spray their, their uh, repair until they actually do have full, full coverage. Let it cure, come back the next day and they start doing their wet sanding. Well, it doesn't take much, uh, you know, uh, removing material before you start to actually see through and you start getting these, you know, these little cherries bleeding through your, uh, your, your patch. A little frustrating. Now, yeah, you know, that's not the end of the world. I mean, again, as long as you're mindful of that and you make sure that, okay, I've got full coverage, let's spray a little bit more. You know, that's fine. That's an easy workaround. Uh, but one, one of the details that uh, I, I guess I've gotten bitten on, well, only once, but it was, it was a hell of a chomp, is a, it's a little detail that, they, that these uh, companies, they have buried somewhere in their literature. I, I tried to find it again uh, this week, and I couldn't find it. Uh, but I know it's there because, uh, I, well, like I said, I got bid on a job. So what they, what they don't tell you is that these products are designed for use above the waterline only. Now, where I kind of got, you know, nailed on this, you know, several, several years ago 
was, you know, you think of gel coat as like, well, it's gel coat. You know, that's something that's always safe to use below the water line, it, you know, anywhere. Well, evidently what happens with, with one of these additives yeah, and gel coat below the water line is that the gel coat blisters horribly. <laughs> and the only, the only fix on that, completely sand it all back off and lay it all back up without using one of those two additives. Yeah, that was a pretty costly little, little lesson learned the hard way. <laughs> so personally, I'm not a real fan of using these additives, just, well, for that reason. I mean, it just, that one hurt, and it left, a, it left a, a bad taste in my mouth going forward. I just, I think I swore to myself, never again. <laughs> but, yeah, that's not to say, I mean, that was, but that was the learning curve. If you're not going to be using them below the water line, you know, maybe it would be a, a great option for you. Who knows? For me, I just, you know, I got bit once and I said no more. <laughs> so that's the short story on your reactive thinners. Now, the other type, the non-reactive thinners, they work, they work in a much different way. Uh, rather than curing as part of the gel coat, they, they work through evaporation. You know, so probably the two most common you know, non-reactive reducers are going to be like acetone or styrene. Now, of the two, of those two options, I personally don't really like to use acetone all that much, uh, just because I found that it, it has a tendency to change the color of the, the color matched gel coat more so than using styrene. Now, when we're talking about gel coat, uh, all that is, it's a polyester-based resin that's loaded up full of pigments, and then to get the viscosity right, it's cut with styrene. So for me, it, it just seems like a, a, a logical thing, you know, to use, you know, a little bit more styrene for thinning the material for spraying. So when it's all said and done, you spray it, all those, uh, those solvents, they evaporate out. So what you're left with when it's all said and done is just straight gel coat on your repair, which coincidentally is perfectly fine to use below the water line. <laughs> All right, so with all that nonsense out of the way, let's, let me get to what I think is arguably the most important little bit of detail when you're trying to use one of these for spraying your gel coat. Now, it all comes down to this little power head right here. Now, I don't know what they use as a propellant in here. Uh, I tried to find it online and, you know, no luck. But the short story of what ends up happening is that as this is discharging, this gets very, very cold. Uh, just as an example here, We'll say right now, this canister is 68 degrees. Okay? I'm just, uh, just so I don't shoot myself in the eye here. All right, so 68 degrees. Try it one more time just to confirm it. Yep. Okay. So why is this little bit of detail important? Well, it all ties into directly with the type of gel coat that you're using. Now, generally, there's two types of gel coat. You've got your laminating, non-waxed gel coat, and then you've got your finishing, or finishing gel coat that does contain wax. The reason that that's important, so the, the wax additive that they use in finishing resins, it's in a liquid state at, I, I don't know exactly what the, the cutoff temperature is, uh, but I know it's, it's fine up, you know, down to like maybe 55, may, you know, maybe 55. I know for sure it's good at still at 60. I can tell you for certain it's not still good at, say, low 50s, mid 40s. Uh, what happens is that as you're, as you're spraying it, the wax that's suspended in that gel coat, it comes up, it cools within that container, and the wax that's in there, it gels and it, it coagulates, it, it solidifies in there, and it jams up your tube, it clogs your nozzle uh, to the point where there's nothing coming out. I mean, it's essentially useless. 
point of the, uh, what I'm getting at here is if you're going to be using one of these prevails, prevails, whatever it's called, one of those sprayers, it's going to be to your advantage to make sure that you're using a laminating gel coat, one that does not contain wax. Just that way you'll actually be able to dump all of the aerosol in that container if you need to, uh, but you, because it doesn't have wax, you're not going to have to worry about it clogging and jamming up on you. So as a quick little demo here, I'm going to mix up two 60 milliliter batches here. So one batch is going to have a gel coat that contains wax. The other batch isn't going to contain any wax. So trying to get the viscosity of, of these two batches of gel coat uh, the same is going to be a little bit of a trial and error. Now normally, if I had what's called a, a Zahn cup, you know, you'd be able to add some reducer to one of your batch and then you pour it through this cup and then however, however long it takes for you know, X amount of material uh, to flow through that cup and stop dripping, well that you can look on there and it'll tell you what your viscosity is. Uh, I don't have one of those, so I'm going to have to do this old school. Now I've got two of these little plastic cups here because I'm pretty sure this styrene is going to melt this plastic pretty quickly. Okay, now as far as how much reducer do you add, I would say, you know, start with around 5% reduction and go from there. So do 5%, don't catalyze it yet, but do 5%, try and uh, do a little test spray and see how well it comes out of the gun or the, 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 the nozzle. If it works, great, awesome. If it doesn't, add a little bit more, but I would say try and keep it down to or less than around 15%, but ultimately at the end of the day, you need to get it thin enough to shoot through the nozzle. So that's the... Uh, that's the goal. So I'm going to add that a little bit. This was a little bit thicker. So now the old school way of doing this is going to be still doing a drip test, but rather than running it through the cup, because there's the same volume of material in each of these, we're going to get it all mixed together. Now this is the non-waxed. This is the, the gel coat that contains wax. And then the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going I'm to take this you know, from the bottom of the cup, lift it up, and see, count how many seconds it takes for this to basically stop dripping. You know, if I can get it to the point where uh, the, the, the time is about the same for both batches to, to stop dripping, then that tells me it may not be 100% exact, but it's pretty darn close. So here. We got, let me try one more time. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. So that was about two seconds. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. So about two seconds. Yeah, see, we're already starting to leak through the cup here. Okay. Now this one. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. That's about the same. Okay. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. All right, so now the word salad that I ended up having edited out of this video just because it was all over the place was uh, essentially saying that by the time I was getting to the end of that roughly 12 by 12 patch, uh, the sprayer was about out of juice, not necessarily out of propellant, but the nozzle was starting to clog and well, it was, it was basically done. And here on the second patch of the, the non-wax material, I'm trying to maintain the same rate of motion, so roughly six inches of, of motion per second. And right off the bat, I'm seeing that there is some definite shelving or curtaining that's happening coming right off the tip. And that is a telltale for one of two things. Either one, the sprayer itself is spraying inconsistently, which definitely happens with these inexpensive sprayers, or I'm just flat out laying out more material because it's not starting to jam up on me at the nozzle. So this is what I'm talking about here. Again, hopefully it's going to show up. Focus, but you can see all the, well, the curtains. 
So at the end of the day, do these little sprayers work well for spraying gel coat? Yes, with a couple little provisions. Uh, the first one being, you know, I would not recommend trying to do this using one of the reactive thinners, all right? So now, the coating that's on here is paper thin. And the only reason we, we have full height is because the pigment level in that gel coat was not cut. Uh, I can guarantee you that if we had that cut, you know, the one-to-one -one ratio, uh, you would still be seeing the, the tan that was behind here. You wouldn't have full coverage. And the other, uh, I guess, little contingency that I would strongly recommend is, even though it didn't quite play out exactly the way that I was, uh, in the way that it's played out for me in the past, um, I would still make sure that you're using a laminating type resin. For the main reason being, you're not, when, you're, when you're spraying an area, you're not going to be able to get all the gel coat sprayed up all in one shot. Uh, you're going to end up with curtains. You know, that's just the reality of it. What you're going to end up doing is spraying your first coat, walking away for an hour or a half hour, depending on what kind of temperatures you're in, obviously. But then coming back, spraying another coat, walking away. You, you need to get that build because these sprayers, they don't lay down a, a very thick film. So you need to kind of go at it um, a few successive times to make sure that you have enough build there so that when you actually sand it and you buff it all out, you didn't actually burn through your gel coat. So I'd say if you follow those two little tips and you're not working in a, a, you know, a too large of an area, like that was roughly one foot, well each patch was one foot by one foot, uh, that's probably about the, the size area that you're, you're going to have because each of these spray cans, they were about out of juice after doing roughly a one by one area. You might be able to go a little bit larger, but I wouldn't go too much larger. I mean, I suppose you can always bring in multiple cans, but uh, but if you follow these little tips, you know, and I, I think these things would be a very good option for you if you're doing a, you know, a repair that's you know, larger than, say, like the size of a quarter. I mean, I wouldn't bother using these for a small, small area, but if you've got to deal with something that's about the size of a basketball, yeah, these little prevails, prevails whatever the heck they're called, uh, they may be a perfect option for you. And on that note, I think I'm going to button this week up. So as always, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you found this helpful. And if you did, hit that thumbs up button. If you're not already subscribed, hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. Thank you in advance. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions, comments, feel free to leave those down below. I will do my best to follow up with you. And as always, I want to thank you for your time. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. And I'll see you next Sunday. This has been a Boatworks Today Projection.